73, the D.L. Moody heard the British evangelist Henry Varley utter those life-changing words. The world has yet to see a man or to see what God can do with and through and in a man who is fully and wholly consecrated to him. Moody replied, I will be that man. And dear friends, indeed, God mightily worked through him. Moody realized that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I want to look at those four wonderful verses this morning. Jesus Christ is Lord. Firstly, we'll, we, we notice that this passage starts with a challenge to the believer. In verses 1 to 4, that they be in the same mind as Christ. In verse 5, it shows us the humility and obedience of Christ, as well as the two natures of Christ. He was both divine and human. In verses 68, but in verses 9 to 11, we see God's response. We see God's response to Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. In verse 68 it says, Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, but took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That was the obedience and the sacrifice of Christ. But look at 9 to 11, God's response. It says, Wherefore God have highly exalted him, he's exalted him, and given him a name, which is above every name, given him a name, that at the name of Jesus, the command that every knee should bow all things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. He goes on to say that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and confess it to the glory of the Father. That's part of God's response in these three verses, verses 9 to 11 this morning. And here is the Father responding to Jesus' death on the cross. The Father highly exalts him. He gives him a name that's way above any other. And dear friends, what does his name mean? I mean, I'm sure we're all aware this morning that his name, they shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. We're going to look more at that tonight because not only is Jesus Christ Lord, but Jesus Christ is Savior. And dear friends, if we are to be reminded of anything this morning, no matter what way we've come into church, surely we should be refreshed in that, that Jesus Christ is Lord and that Jesus Christ is in control. So the Father exalts Jesus. Why does he exalt him? He exalts him that every knee should bow. That's powerful. Of course, we live in a world today, don't we, where very few in the grand scheme of things bow, will bow their knee to Jesus. But here we are as a group of God's children this morning, and we willingly bow because we realize in our hearts that he's our Lord. We realize in our hearts that Jesus Christ is Lord, and we are encouraged by that this morning. Not only does the Father exalt him in verse 9, but he exalts him to bring about universal submission. In verse 10, he says that at the name of Jesus, every knee, that's everyone, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth. And every tongue, imagine, every knee, shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
to the glory of God the Father. Every tongue will confess this, dear friends, whether they be angels, whether they be men, whether they be demons or devils, and it will all be to the glory of God the Father. One commentator puts it well. It's not the mere sound of the word, but the authority of Jesus that all should pay solemn homage. It is to the glory of God the Father to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, for it is his will that all men should honour the Son as they honour the Father. John chapter 5 and verse 23. The word Lord here is denoting that he is the owner or he is the, the ruler or he is the sovereign of the whole universe. And Paul addresses Jesus as the Lord and I just was struck when preparing this message that yes, he addresses Jesus as the Lord. We, can, we, we come and we address him as the Lord. But he also addresses his converts in the Lord. And isn't that wonderful that whenever a boy or a girl, like we were talking to this morning, or an older person, when they come and put their faith in Christ, that automatically there's that connection. Because they're brought into the same family that you were brought into. And now we're in the Lord. We're no longer outside, but we're in the Lord. When we refer to someone as Lord, we're recognizing or respecting them as a ruler of something like the House of Lords in Westminster. We're not addressing them as the Lord in this sense, but we're respecting their position. The resurrection, however, brought about a higher meaning because it became a way of declaring the deity of Jesus Christ. Uh, that Jesus Christ is not just the ruler of the universe, but Jesus Christ is the God of the universe. Because we read there, as we do throughout Scripture, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Dear friends, just like the boys and the girls could only hold a limited amount of things in their hands, but as I took that engineer through the north coast, up, up, up the, 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 the coast on, on Thursday night, I, and just the, the creation, and the, it was just a perfect night, and even Ivan said to me, he says, Keith, this is a perfect night for this. And yet he holds it all in his hand. He's the Lord. He's the creator. He's the sustainer of everything. Remember Thomas in John chapter 20 and verse 28. Remember we're thinking here that the resurrection brought a higher meaning because it was a way of declaring the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even though before the resurrection we have clear indication that Jesus Christ was and is and forever will be God. So what did Thomas say? He addressed the, the resurrected Jesus as my Lord and my God. He knew that this was the very God of creation that was resurrected from the dead in the form of Jesus Christ. The one that humbled himself and became obedient even to the death of the cross. And from then on, the apostles' message was, Jesus Christ is Lord. From then on, it was to declare his deity. It was to declare that Jesus Christ was the, the God of the universe. Peter preaching at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and verse 36 says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that 
God have made this same Jesus whom ye have crucified both Lord and Christ. To say Jesus Christ is Lord to say is to say that he is supreme authority over all things. We see that in verse 10. We see that in verse 10 because it says that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Things in heaven and things on the earth and things under the earth. And that's a challenge, dear God, dear friends, to, to you and to me as believers this morning. That he has supreme authority over all of our life. Challenge in words, isn't it? Let's be honest this morning. To say that he has supreme authority. To call him Lord is to submit to his authority and his rulership over all of our lives. That means, dear friends, we obey him. In Luke chapter 6 and verse 46, Jesus says, And why call ye me Lord, and do not the things which I say? Why call ye me Lord, and do not the things which I say? When Jesus is Lord, we obey him. Augustine said that Jesus Christ is not valued at all until he's valued above all. That's right. Vance Havner said a wife who is 85% faithful to her husband is not faithful at all. There is no such thing as part-time loyalty to Jesus Christ. Ye call me light and see me night not. We were thinking about that earlier, the light of the world. Ye call me light and see me not. Ye call me the way and follow me not. Ye call me life and desire me not. Ye call me wise and acknowledge me not. Ye call me fair and love me not. Ye call me rich and ask me not. Ye call me eternal and seek me not. Ye call me gracious and trust me not. Ye call me noble and serve me not. Ye call me mighty and honor me not. Ye call me just and fear me not. Ye call me Lord and obey me not. I was reading those words just recently. Ye call me light and see me not. Call me Lord and obey me not. Then he goes on to say, if I condemn you, blame me not. Dear friends, Jesus Christ is Lord. But to say those four words is only through divine revelation. Paul, when writing to the Corinthians, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 3, Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God call, calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. It's a divine revelation. Only a spiritual person can say these words and mean it. One of the great pitfalls, pitfalls or dangers for the believer is to slip into this attitude of, I'm doing well. God will be pleased with me. No, dear friends, God is pleased with the Son. And remember what the Father said when Jesus went, was being brought up out of the water in his baptism. He said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. God isn't happy with man and his sin. That's why he sent his son. To bring us back to God through the new birth. It's a new creation. It's Christ living in us. The hope of glory. And John reminds us in John chapter 14 and verse 20. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father and ye in me and I in you. 
Think of those words. I in ye. What a privilege for the believer this morning that the very God that holds the earth in the palm of his hand and he's big enough to do that and yet he's small enough to live within our hearts. He's small enough that you and I would come to him and we would cry, Jesus Christ is Lord. A lot of people that I meet, and I, I mean Christian people, are living in defeat. And I believe it's because they are trying to live the Christian life in the flesh. And I believe this is a big problem in the church today. I really do. A lot of people are trying to live the Christian life in the flesh. And it can't be done. Essentially, like Israel, who rejected their Messiah, as Paul wrote in Romans 10, chapter 3, they are ignorant of God's righteousness, and they're going about to establish their own righteousness, having not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God is Jesus living in the believer. He took my sin and he gave me his life that I and you as believers this morning are covered in a robe of righteousness and that righteousness is from God himself. Even the righteousness of God which is faith from Jesus Christ. How could a person try to live the Christian life in the flesh? I love Romans 10 and verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. In other words, Christ has fulfilled or accomplished the, the purpose for which the law was given. Isn't that powerful? As a result, all who believe in him are made righteous. And, and all who believe in him and who are made righteous can say these four, four words from divine revelation that Jesus Christ is Lord. These Philippians believers had a special place in Paul's heart. And I love some of his letters, but particularly some of the way he, he opens up and addresses his letters. I love all of his letters, but what I'm, I'm trying to say is I love the way he speaks to some of these congregation. And he had a special love in his heart for these people. He says in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 7, even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my, in my bonds or in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye are all partakers of my grace. Remember Jesus says, I am the Father and I in you. You see the fellowship of the saints and here was this great apostle, the one that persecuted the church, the one that was taking Christians to be stoned, the one that was holding the coat at the stoning of the first martyr Stephen. And here is him remarkably and wonderfully converted and this man who had a real heart for these Philippian believers. Do you know what he wanted for them? He says, we just read in verse 7, because I have you in my heart. But do you know what he wanted for them? Read on down to verse 11 of chapter 1. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness 
which are by Jesus Christ. Oh, it's lovely. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ. And again, he goes on to say, unto the glory of God. Unto the glory and praise of God. You see what I'm trying to say this morning, dear friend. It's only by Jesus Christ. He is our righteousness. I remember the text on the wall in our church growing up. And I don't know what your text is. Jesus Christ is Lord. But our text was the Lord, our righteousness. And dear friends, when we realize the righteousness of God and who we are in the who we are as believers this morning in God, the, the, the Christian life is not coming to Christ by faith and afterwards trying to please him in the flesh. That's why Paul wrote the, the book to the Galatians uh, in Galatians chapter. 3 and verses 3 to 6, if you turn with me quickly. Galatians chapter 3 and verses 3 to 6. Are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you the spirit and worketh miracles among you, doth it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Even as Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Having begun in the spirit, are you near made perfect in the flesh? Dear friends, the Christian life is coming to Christ by faith. And when we realize that we are his workmanship, created unto good works. We all know that great verse in Ephesians 2, verse 9, for by grace he is saved through faith. But in verse 10, he goes on to say that we're created in Christ Jesus unto good works. See, dear friends, they're not your good works and they're not my good works, but they're his good works because it's Christ living Jesus Christ, the righteousness of God, takes our sin and imputes his righteousness onto us. Dear friends, it's realizing who we already are in Jesus Christ this morning, I believe. Not who we are trying to be, but it's who we are. I'm a child of the Lord. If you're saved in the gathering this morning, you also are a child of the Lord. Who are we in Christ? Well, we're children of God. In John chapter 1 and verse 12, he says, But as many as received him, to them give he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe in his name. We're children of God. We are called according to his purpose in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. We are redeemed in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. We read, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to his grace. We are a new creation in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. Therefore, if any man be in Christ... He is a new creature. Old things are passed away and behold, all things become new. We are crucified with Christ. Romans chapter 6 and verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that, we, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. We're under new rulership. We're raised with Christ and seated with Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6. And have raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly place. Do you see who you are in Christ? 
Dear friends, we're citizens of heaven because in Philippians that we read here, if we were to go to chapter 3 and verse 20, this is who the believer is this morning. He's a citizen of heaven. Hallelujah. For our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our conversation, our citizenship is in heaven. Dear friends, we are all of these things and much, much more when we're truly born again, washed in the precious blood, and born again of the Spirit of God. Even the angels confess him as Lord, but the believer not only confesses him as Lord, but the true believer owns him I mean, if you go out to Colerain, you go up the town, and I'm sure many would confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But how many would own him as Lord? Dear friends, here are we this morning, and we own the Lord Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ is Lord. Dear friends, Paul, of course, when he wrote that great chapter in Romans chapter 6, he refers sin as being the sin nature. And that's who we are. When we're born into this world, we have a nature of sin. We're sinners by nature. We're sinners by practice. You see, because we are sinners, we're controlled by sin. But when we become believers, we're no longer controlled by our sin nature, but our new nature, which is spiritual and not fleshly. And of course, Paul said that Christ died for sinners and he breaks the power of sin. I'm sure you've experienced as believers, I love to hear testimonies of drug addicts and alcoholics and nicotine addicts, how the Lord broke their power. I was speaking to a guy just about six weeks ago who had called in for tracks covered in tattoos and you could just tell they had a hard life. As some people would say, a hard paper out, and he did. But he came in buzzing for the Lord. He says, the Lord delivered me from paramilitary. The Lord delivered me from alcohol. The Lord delivered me from drugs. And he says, I'm here to get the ammunition that I could go out there that others too would hear that Jesus Christ is Lord. Christ's death on the cross, dear friends, breaks the power of sin. And he replaces that power of sin with his power, enabling us, empowering us, and bringing us into a new servant attitude that we would serve him as Lord instead of serving that old nature of sin and death. Sin has power, dear friends. I don't need to tell you that. Sin has power at the lowest level of a, of a man that was broken in sin and paramilitaries and drugs and drink. 
sin also has power at the higher levels of government and corruption. And world leaders that the power is broken because of the blood. And dear friends, we're under one of two powers this morning. We're under the power and the nature of sin, or we're under the power and the nature of God. We're either going about to establish our own righteousness, or we're submitting to the righteousness of God. It's believing in the heart that a person is made righteous with God. And as chapter 1 and verse 17 says, God's righteousness is found only by faith in Christ. The believer is under a new law, the law of faith. In closing, I want you to notice that Paul was in prison when writing this letter. I think that's absolutely remarkable. Here's a man in prison. They're seeking to kill him. And he says, as he says in chapter 1 and verse 7, was it that his love for this congregation in Philippi was, they were in his heart. He was thinking of others. He wasn't thinking of the situation that he was in, but he was thinking of this church. He was confessing that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and he was doing it to the glory of the Father. That every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. He closes this section in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 11 with those words. To the glory of God, the Father. We've already quoted verse 11a, that he wanted them to be filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ. Again, he says, the latter part of the verse, unto the glory and praise of God. Dear friends, it's all unto the glory and the praise of God. God must receive all the glory. He is Lord. Dear friends, I want every one of us to leave this morning realizing that it's his righteousness. And like Paul for the Philippians, that we would be filled with the fruits of righteousness. Jesus, in his high priestly prayer in John 17 and verse 5, and now, O Father, glorify thou me thine own self with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. He says in John 14 and verse 13, whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. John 16, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide isn't that wonderful for the believer that Jesus Christ, who is Lord, guides us, leads us. He will guide you. And I love this about the Spirit of God, for how be it when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. Dear friends, I would urge you, and I've seen it. Don't you ever let a man in this pulpit that 
God speaks and glorifies in himself. We want a man in this pulpit that speaks and glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to say, but whatever, whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he shall show you things to come. He shall glorify me. Dear friends, it's either his glory or it's ours. And it's either Jesus Christ is Lord or dear friends, we are Lord. Let's be reminded this morning. Let's be encouraged this morning that Jesus Christ is Lord. We'll just sing a verse.